So I'm feeling very happy to be here with all of you today. I'm very blessed, feeling very blessed to be with all of you. And the devotees have asked me to speak today on this famous verse from Chaitanya Charitamrita, statement of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He said, Bharata Bhumiti Manushla Jhoyla Janmajar Janma Sartat Kari Para Paropakar. Everyone's heard this verse, no? Very famous. So we want to discuss today. First principle, Bharata Bhumiti. Bharat is the most auspicious place on the face of this earth. This is a statement of Bhagavatam. It's not my sentiment because I've dropped everything and moved to Bharat. 2018, we sold our property, burned bridges, and moved to Mayapur. One of the best decisions of my life. Aside from joining ISKCON, that was the best decision of my life. So Bharat is a special place. It's stated in Bhagavatam, 5th Canto, 19th chapter, that the demigods, after their punya is exhausted, they hope and they pray that they have enough punya left so they can be born in this country, Bharat. So what is it that makes Bharat special? <coughs> this is the land of Krishna, the land of Rama, of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, of Rishabdhi, Buddha. They came here to this land, not to Paris, not to London, not to Adelaide. They came here. This is sacred land, the dust from the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of God that blesses this tract of land. And they choose to come here. But let me tell you something. One of the most painful things for a Videshi Vaishnav like myself is to see Bharatiya people, Indian people, rejecting their own culture. Become hateful to their own country. Like if you're in public and wearing dhoti and kurta, you think, what's wrong with you, man? <laughs> and you're like a dinosaur. <laughs> so backwards. Get with it. Where's your jeans? Your tank top? Your let's go. You know, what do they say? I'm sort of out of touch with modern things. Just do it. <coughs> right. They think you're crazy. But we think you're crazy. And we have justification to feel that way. Because life is temporary. But the whole materialistic principle is eat, drink, and be merry. And they have no other objective in life. When we drive here, the, the roads are packed with people. Where are they going? And what do they want in life? Are they all going to the mandir? They're going to some satsang program. They're going out to distribute books. They're going to work hard to collect rupees to spend for sense gratification. Bhagavatam says, Nunam pramata kurute vikarma yadindraya prite apranoti nasado manye yata atmano yam asana pikleshita asadeha. This endeavor will just give you another body in which we suffer. Janma mrityu jara vyadi, birth, death, old age, and disease. Is this a philosophical idea? Like our Hare Krishna perspective on life? That there's birth, death, old age, and disease? These are the realities of life. It's this objective, naked truth that we have to die. We have to get old. We become diseased. And then if you don't get it right, you have to do the whole thing over again. What is that? Squeezed out of mother's womb. Is that a fun thing? Mother's screaming in pain. Babies comes out crying. And welcome to the world. Slap on the butt. <laughs> welcome to the material world. <laughs> the baby cries. And when someone dies, they cry. It's a crying sandwich. On one side crying, other side crying. In between, you struggle for life. You don't even know how to walk. The, the baby can't even crawl. One day he learns how to crawl. Then one day he, he stands up and he can start to walk. He falls and bangs his head. Eventually he learns how to walk. And life is good. Everyone's, Kuchi, Kuchi, oh, you're so cute, you're so nice. 
then some when, then one day someone says now it's time to go to school school <laughs> what is that yes you have to learn to read and write and mathematics and history and geometry science school so you, they put in grade school after grade school you have to go to high school and in high school you have to be cool <laughs> have to have the right cell phone the right clothes, the right girlfriend, see the right movies, eat the right food, hang out with the right people, be popular. Then in their about 12th standard, people start asking you, what do you want to be? What do you mean, what do I want to, I'm me. What do you mean, what do you want to be? No, what do you want to be, how do you want to make money in life? And they start, pressurizing you to go to a good college, spend lots of money to get an education to what? When you graduate, then you go out begging, please hire me, I'll make you money, I'll be a good employee, please give me some position. Please, please. <laughs> so you get a job and they pay you money. And with that money you find a flat, you find a girl, fall in love. Little Pagole. <laughs> <laughs> then what comes? More babies. Then you have to educate them and feed them and clothe them and take them to the doctor. Put them back together when they're upset. <clears throat> then one day they say, bye mom, bye dad, it's been fun, thanks a lot. <laughs> Most of you are, are in that mode, I think leave the nest. That's in English we call it empty nest syndrome. When all the birdies fly away from mom and dad. And then mom and dad are there together and they're deeply in love with each other, spent their life together. But what is the future of mom and dad? One of them dies and the other one cries. Is it true? In every relationship, no matter how amenable it is, how harmonious it is, how loving it is. One of you will die and the other one will cry. Either husband dies, wife cries, wife dies, husband cries. This is the future of every relationship. And then death itself comes to you and takes you away. This is the future of material life. Is it just our opinion or is this how life goes on? These are naked truths of what this material world is. So life in Bharat, being born in this country, gives intrinsic understanding of the problems of life. But what are the problems and what are the solutions? Solutions we find in Shastra. Bhagavad Gita says, Na shastra vinimutshuja vartate kama karata na sasiddham avapnoti na sukham na param gati. You want to be happy? You want to elevate yourself? Then Shastra Vidhi is there. And where do we find Shastra? In Australia? Japan? America? Shastra was spoken here, in this place, Nami Sharanya, Kurukshetra, the greatest contribution to human society, known to man, occurred here in Bharat. So someone born here is very, very fortunate. Bharata Bhumiti, Manusha Janmaja. To be born as a human, human being, because not everyone even gets a human form of life. Think how rare it is to be born as a human being. I live on the bank of Ganga. Ganga is a very big river, but comparatively speaking for the universe, it's a small river. But can we count how many living beings are in Ganga? Every little protozoan, every fish, every snail, every bit of algae. They're living beings like all of us. By their karma, they get, they get their birth as a fish. Of course, they're very fortunate fish to be born in Ganga. They're on their way back to Gaida. Shankaracharya said, better to be born a fish in Ganga or a turtle in the bank of Ganga than to be born as a king. So there's billions of such living beings, just in one square meter of earth. 
There's worms and ants and blades of grass. They're living beings like us. Where, how do we know wherever there's life? Wherever we see life, we can understand there's Atma, like us. So how many Atmas are there in the creation of God? Innumerable. You can't count them. Asankhya. Innumerable living beings. But a few fortunate beings are born as human beings. Manusha Janmaja. So what is the duty of a human being? Janma Sarta Kari. Become perfect. And what is perfection? A degree? My father was a very educated man. He was orthopedic surgeon. Had big degrees. He taught orthopedics at, at the University of California. I shall tell you a funny story in that regard. I was sitting in uh, Bhaktivedanta village in Northern California. It was Gurukula. I was a pujari and a cook. So one of my godbrothers, His Grace Pushta Krishna Prabhu, who unfortunately is no longer with us. He, when he's serving Prabhupada somewhere else. So we're sitting having lunch and he went back to school to finish his MD and he was studying orthopedics. So he's telling me, we're talking about how parents reacted to their son or daughter becoming devotee. He said, oh, my parents are there. They were not happy. So the doctor in charge who was teaching orthopedics and there's, they're operating on someone's body, right? They're drilling holes through bones and having this discussion. So the doctor in charge started saying, my son also became Hare Krishna. <laughs> he's like a crazy boy. But you know, recently I, he's, he's settled down a lot. It's probably not so bad. So I asked Pushta Krishna, who is that? What was his name? Well, that was Dr. Church. I said, Pushta Krishna Prabhu, that was my father. You were studying orthopedics from my father. So he had big degree. He was a lieutenant colonel in the United States Air Force. Big degrees, orthopedic surgeon, professor, blah, blah, blah. But did it help him at the time of death? It cannot. It cannot. A more fortunate person who has a simple life, even rickshawwala, who is Krishna, like I was watching one, a rickshaw was in front of us. What's it say? Radhe Radhe. <laughs> Om Namah Shivaya. Jai Shri Krishna. Hari Bol. They're more fortunate. Because they're in Bharat. They've been born in this country where this understanding is second nature. When I first came to the temple in 1973, July, some friends invited us. They said, come on, we're going to Hare Krishna temple. I said, what's that? I said, well, they're like yogis. So what? Who cares? But they serve this really tasty vegetarian food. Is it? <laughs> Chale, let's go. <laughs> when I walked in, I wasn't going to go inside, actually. Because I saw all these shoes outside the door. I thought, what are these, some crazy hippies? Running barefoot inside? What are they doing? Not for me. So I'm sitting in the car by myself, looking at my watch. Okay, I'm going in. So I open the door. What do I see? Dinabandhu Prabhu. Very good looking young man, big white tilak, freshly shaven head. And what are they doing? Agnihotra. I thought, whoa, they're building a fire in the living room. Because it wasn't a temple. It was a rented house. And then everyone was offering their obeisances to Gornitai. Gornitai was there on the altar. Okay, I can do that. So I offered my obeisances to Gornitai. Then they gave us this Haman, Haman Samagri. Jo, Til, Ghi. They put it in my hand. I thought, is this a feast? <laughs> this is what vegetarian food is all about? Am I supposed to eat this? I said, no, 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 you, you throw it in the fire and say swaha. Okay, swaha. So afterwards they served feast. And I was so like dirty dog in front of these brilliant, bright-faced, effulgent Vaishnavas. I felt very embarrassed to even eat in front of them. But I took some prasadam. 
After prasanam, we did tulsi arati. Yani kani chapapani brahmahatya di kani cha. Little tulsi mahani, this big little silver cup I can still see in my mind. I watered tulsi devi. That night I watered tulsi devi. I took prasanam, offered grains in the sacred fire, and offered pranam to Gornitai, and my life was never the same. Two weeks later, I dropped out of college, moved to the temple, said goodbye to the material world, and never looked back. And it was the best decision of my life. Best decision. But when we came, we didn't know what is arati, what is kirtan, what is a deity, what is a mridanga, what is bhajan. We thought we're just going to go eat some vegetarian food. Because in the culture I grew up in, these things are unknown. The greatest asset for human life, a relationship, a direct relationship with God by kirtan, by shastra, by sadhu, is unknown in Western countries. But by the grace, the causeless mercy of my Guru Maharaj, there was a temple in Portland, Oregon. And I was somehow or other drawn there by, by destiny. And somehow or other I was drawn to offer my life. And actually the turning point was this. We would go and talk to Dina Bandha. We don't know what is kirtan, arati, nothing. We thought, let us go talk to that guy, Dina Bandha. Because he's the nicest guy we ever met. And he'd tell us stories about Krishna. He'd tell us stories about how he became a devotee. So we went one day, and Dina Bandha was out of station. But his wife was there, Akuti Mataji. Dina Bandha would joke, yeah, Akuti Mataji is the best brahmachari in the temple. Because <laughs> she could play the Madanga better. She'd give a better class. We were all like gross neophyte devotees. So Akuti Mataji was there, and she filled us up to the neck with wet cauliflower potato. I still remember. Wet cauliflower, potato, sabji, halava, puri, chutney, samosa. We couldn't move. <laughs> so my, my friend said, OK, let's go. Akuti Mataji said, probably one of the most profound things in my life that changed my life, said, why are you going? And I thought, why am I going? These people are wonderful. This food is wonderful. This philosophy is wonderful. I'm going to stay. And that's how I became a devotee. But this isn't the culture of America. This is an extraordinary thing. But this is ordinary for all of you. You grow up knowing what is Arati, what is Kirtan, what is Gita, what is Bhagwan. It's second nature to you because of your punya. We, we, when we say prasanam, we recite what? Maha prasadi govinde nama brahmani vaishnavi swapa punyavatam rajan vishvaso naivajayate Your favorite mantra, no? <laughs> so what does it mean? What does it mean, Prabhuji? Very good. Oftentimes I ask people, what does it mean? They're like, uh, we're going to eat? <laughs> we're getting ready. To, the mantra means we're going to eat soon. Swapa punyabatam rajan, O king. Someone who has very little punya, they can have no appreciation for guru, for Vaishnava, Brahmana, Mahaprasad, holy name, Govinda. Because no punya. Naiva, their faith, naiva jayavid, vishvas, their faith is never born. Na jayate. But that's not the, the case for most of people born in Bara. As human beings, manusha, hoila, janmajar. So what is our real objective of life? Wherever you're born, and in particular in Bara, janma sartakkari. Make your life perfect. And perfection doesn't mean a big degree. Because even though my father had big education, when he left his body, he was full of sadness, full of lamentation and fear. My godbrother, my esteemed godbrother, Rajendra Nandan Prabhu, left this world about eight months ago now. And he said, in the last days of his life, you cannot imagine the happiness I'm experiencing. The happiness I'm experiencing. 
Is that the typical reaction of someone approaching death? They're full of fear and lamentation. Why didn't I do this? And why did, just give me a little more time to get my life together. There's no more time. When death comes, there's no more time. But he left this world full of joy with a smile on his face and his hand in his bead bag. And when he got the diagnosis of terminal cancer, he told the devotees, don't pray for a cure. Pray for my successful transit to the kingdom of God. So when that time came, seeing that the, I'm leaving the material world, I'm done with birth and death in the material world, he was full of joy. Full of joy. I met one man yesterday. He has some serious disease and he's simply crying. Simply lamentation. Why don't I why can't I have my health back? Why is this happening to me? It happens to all of us. His life is my life, and the only thing that separates is time. This is the this is another beauty of Bharatiya Sanskriti. In America, they put you in a box and cover everything up and put you in the ground, put the body in the ground. But in Bharat, what it make a stack of wood, here's the body, and here where you see it burned. And a thoughtful person thinks, ha, huh, this is my life someday. That's my body someday on a stack of wood being burned. This is the beauty of your culture, the culture of knowledge, the culture of realization, the objective of becoming perfect, sartakkari. Perfection means to know who are you. This is the first aphorism of Vedanta Sutra. Atato Brahma Jigyasa. Like, who are you? But typically you walk up to a guy and you go, Who are you? You say, What's it to you? Who are you asking? What do you mean, who am I? I'm Hasmuk Patel. <laughs> no, who are you? I'm Gita Ben's husband, of course. Now, who are you? Uh, I'm the father of Smita and Rita and Sangeeta <laughs> and Pinky. <laughs> That's not, no, who are you? I'm Gujarati. Excuse if everyone, if anyone is Gujarati here, please excuse me for making a little joke. Is he Gujarati? Is he Indian even? Is he even human being? Because they're devoid of atma tattva, they have no understanding, even what is the self. So you ask someone, who are you? And they don't know. If you don't know who you are, how will you be happy in life? Is it possible? You cannot be happy if you don't even know the objective of life. The objective of life is self-realization. To know who you are, who is God, and how to get there, to the kingdom of God. This knowledge is unavailable, practically speaking, in any other place in the world. Because other religions, with, with all due respect, because they want a relationship with God, but they're primitive, they have very primitive understanding of God. They have no understanding of Atma. They say there's no past life and there's no future life. Only one lifetime. And if you're good, then you can go to heaven. And if you're bad, you're going to go to hell. Forever. And you're going to be sitting in a lake of fire. And the devil's there. He's poking you with a spear. Trishul. And there's fire and brimstone. And you can't breathe. And it's hot. And you're suffering forever in flames of hell. But God loves you. Is that love? Is that a proper understanding? There is hell. Read fifth canto of Bhagavatam. But it's not forever. It's to reform a sinful person. There's primitive understanding. If, and if you go to hell, you're going to be sitting right next to Donald Trump. <laughs> because you, you didn't become a Christian or you didn't become, do it this way or that way. Everything was pious about your life. You never robbed, steal, you never cheated on your wife, you're a pious man, help people, you're friendly. But you didn't accept 
Jesus, so now you're going to go to hell and you're going to be sitting next to a murderer, a robber, a cheat, a rapist, bank robber. Does that make sense? It's just, there's just a good place and a bad place. This is primitive understanding of spirituality. And if there's, if there's no conception of previous lifetime, who were you before you were you? Who were you before you were you? And what is your explanation? Why is someone born? Virat Kohli, famous athlete, and another person is born crippled. Why is someone Ambani and someone's Chamar Bangi, Rikshawala, struggling just to put food in their mouth? What is the explanation? Someone's rich, someone's poor, someone's famous, someone's infamous, someone's strong, someone's weak, someone's smart, someone's... What is the explanation if there's no previous lifetime? Tattainu kampam susamikshamana bunjana evatma kritam vipakam Bhagavatam says, Whenever our life, evadna kritam vipakam, we've created our life from our previous activities. What other reasonable explanation is there? So, sata kare, make your life perfect, understand these principles, irrefutable principles of life. Make your life perfect. And then do what? Sit at Radha Kund and Radhe Radhe. Is that what a Vaishnava does? Is that the example shown by Saraswati Thakur, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, by Bhakti Vinod Thakur? You, you all know about Bhakti Vriksha groups, right? Bhakti Vinod Thakur managed 500 Bhakti Vriksha groups. Very powerful preacher. He'd sleep two hours at night, eat two chapatis, drink some milk, go to sleep for two hours, get up and write Sharnagati, Gitavali. Chaitanya uh, Sikshamrita. So much contribution to society. Why? To help other people. And Vaishnava is not self interested. Paradukha Dukhi. Kripamudir. He's full of mercy. That's why we bow down to Vaishnavas. Bancha Kaupatrubhisha. Kripa Sindhu Bhyevacha. Is that just something we say? Kripa Sindhu Bhyevacha Pinita Bhami Vaishnava Maribo. What does it mean? Kripa Sindhu. It's an ocean of mercy. Why? Because <coughs> he wants to help other people. He can't be satisfied without helping other people. Jonas Salk, famous scientist, discovered the polio vaccine. He could have th thought, okay, I discovered this polio vaccine. I'm going to shoot myself in the arm and my family and the rest of the world can go to hell and they can be, suffer from this debilitating, crippling disease, polio. Because he shared it with the world, practically today, polio is unknown. Out of his generosity, out of his compassion, out of his thoughtfulness, his care for the welfare of human society. So we have the vaccine to change the world. That is Shastra, and that is Holy Name. This vaccine is what? Nene chayo shodi maya nashi barulagi. Bhaktivinoda Thakur said. This medicine, Oshodi, medicine is what? It's the holy name of Krishna. Non-sectarian process of self-realization. Because by chanting this name of Krishna, the world can change, become free from, from all types of suffering. And it's so important that God Himself comes. Jagai Sankirtana prayer, Yajanti Hisumedasa. And fortunate people that are endowed with sufficient intelligence take up the process of this simple thing, chanting Krishna's name. This is Sartak Kari, trying to help other people. Uh, uh, Paropakar. And what's, hap <laughs> what's happening today? Indian, the, the persons who are the keepers of this knowledge, traditionally, Bharatiyas, what are they doing? They're going to America and taking IT positions. This is the, the, the rule of export-export, import-export, right? When there's a shortage of something in one place, and there's a market for it coming from another place. There's a shortage of good brains in America, so we're importing 
brains, good brains, thoughtful brains from India to come work in IT positions. In America is full. 300, 400,000 IT professionals are working. But will that give them the happiness they're looking for? And will it help society? And it is, what, is this what India has to offer to the world? IT profession. You can do that. But in my experience having, because my preaching portfolio, for whatever reason, is the Indian community. My wife is Indian, my friends are Indian, my guru is Indian, I wear Indian clothes, I eat Indian food, I live in India. Hindustani. <laughs> so is this the perfection of life? Get a degree and go to America? But what do I see there? Indian families that do that, they become nasty Americans. They lose their culture. They take up eating all untouchable foods. Their children become nasty little Americans. You see our kids. Namaste, Narasimhaya. So cute. What are the American kids? Hey, dude, what's going on, man? <laughs> because of culture. Sangat Sanjayate Kama. We develop our desires, our objectives in life, what we, what's important to us, what we want in life, by the company we keep. So Indian families move to America. They put their kids in public school and they develop all nasty habits. And my friend gave me chicken today. What's chicken, mommy? You ate chicken? Oh my God. And they started eating all kinds of nonsense food. And the girls come home with an African boyfriend. And I'll tell you a true story. We would travel, as Prabhuji was saying, to the prison, in big prison. 1,400 prisoners are there. So we'd go there every month to the prison and to local Bhakti Riksha group and we'd stay with one wonderful family, disciples of His Holiness Bhakti Charu Maharaj. Nice Punjabi family. So at the time, their youngest son, said, I want some guy time. I want to talk with you. I have a personal conversation. They said, okay, let's go for a walk. So he went for a walk and he started complaining. In school, he's 12 years old, by the way. He said, at school, they tease me. They say that I'm gay because they don't have a girlfriend. He's 12 years old. Is 12 years old the time to have a girlfriend? To go dating? To hop in bed together? 12 years old? There's a time for everything, but not 12 years old. This is what's happening in America. Children, little girls and little boys are hopping in the bed together because of the culture of the place and being brainwashed by media. And you see little girls, they're not even, they even have no breasts, but they're dressing like a sexy girl with eye makeup and lipstick and they dance and shake, they shake their body like they have breasts but they have no breasts. This is the culture of, the nonsense culture of Western culture. And families that move there, this is what happens to them. And I've seen it over and over again. The opposite thing happens too sometimes. They move to America and they join Bhakti Riksha program <laughs> and they become devotees. Then they come back to um, India and their family says, what happened to you? This Kanti Mala Tilak, and you went to America, you got Kanti Mala Tilak in America. <laughs> so we do this thing. If there's any feeling in your heart, any sense of compassion in your heart, we want to help someone else. And the best way to help them is to introduce them to Krishna consciousness. So this is your culture. And I'm a cultural interloper. Somehow or other I was fortunate to be blessed with this culture, with this process, this religious experience of Krishna consciousness. So it's, nat it's your nature, second nature for all of you. So do something, share it. If you want to make money, get a job, have a family, good, I did. I worked for 20 years, like a dog. 
for 20 years. I made good money also, but it never touched my heart. And in, in retrospect, it was a waste of time. I could have been in my home for 20 years. How happy I would be. So whatever you do in your life, don't leave Krishna consciousness. Bhaktivinoda Thakur said, Grihe Thako, Vane Thako, Sada Hari Bolu Thako. In Grihasta Ashram, or in Sanyas Ashram, Brahmachari Ashram, Vandaprastha Ashram, Tyagis, chant Krishna's name, because that will give us the perfection of life. So this is an important verse from Chaitanya Charitamrita. We touched on a few things. I hope I, had, I hope I said something that's useful to you, encourages you. And what is, what is our schedule, by the way? 9.15. Huh? 9.15. So anyone has any question, comment, corrections? Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Uh. It was very nice, nice, nice explanation. Uh, I have a question that uh, uh, when Prabhupada was in early years, uh, he joined Mahatma Gandhi movement, Corporate India movement. So his father was not a bit happy with him. So <laughs> his father was saying that, well, uh, he saying that uh, his son should, uh, should do Krishna Bhakti, not all these things. I have heard, I have read in books. So, uh, so is it right to live for the country at, at, at that level, at in this way? Or if, suppose if someone is army, suppose if someone is police, if, 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 he, if he let down his life for the country, motherland. So what, how, uh, <coughs> what will be his destiny? What will be his destination? Suppose if, if someone is not spiritual, it, it will incline and he is let down his life for the country. So what will be the inclination? What will be his destination? Bhagavad Gita says unto Kali Jamameva Smaran Mukva Kaliram Yas Prayati Samad Bhavam Yati Nasakta Samsai Yam Yam Bhavi Smaran Bhavam Tajantanti Kaliram Tam Tami Vaiti Kuntaya Sadatar Bhavi He says whatever you think about where is your consciousness Anta Kali at the time of life that is your destination not whether you're fighting for a good cause you're fighting for that cause where is your consciousness because according to Vedic social standards someone can be Katriya and fight for just cause. But where do we find just cause today? Where do we find? All politics. People are fighting over stolen bread. As we sit here, there's probably 50,000 Indian soldiers on the border of China. And there's 50,000 soldiers, uh, Chinese soldiers. And they're ready to kill each other over dirt. It's the same dirt. No, this is our dirt. No, it's our dirt. <laughs> It was there before we were born, and it will be there after we die. But if we can introduce a simple thing to society, we can stop war forever. What is that? Ishava Samidam Sarvam, Jatkincha Jagatam Jagat, Tena Taktena Bunjita, Magradha Kasisidam. The things all of you learn in the first few weeks of your exposure to Krishna consciousness can change the world. So it's not what you're fighting for, it's your consciousness that is important. Even Srila Prabhupada would tell the story about a Muslim man who was being attacked by a boar. You know, the big, the big ones have these big tusks, right? He's being attacked by a boar and he's dying, but he's chanting, Haram! Not Haram! 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 But this is Nama Vas. He was liberated because the word Ram came from his mouth. Ajamyal also. He was calling for his son. Narayan! Vishnu Dutus came. He is sinless because he's chanted the holy name. So what is your consciousness? This is determines the next life. But this is a, there's a corollary discussion about politics and all that. Because Prabhupada was follower of Mahatma Gandhi because he was outraged by what the British were doing to this country. And it's outrageous. They invaded this country. They brainwashed this country and made you all feel like you're second class. This is the greatest culture in the world, bar none. 
the greatest culture. And they brainwash and made everyone think that native culture and native dress all second class. Who is second class? The British are a bunch of pigs. <laughs> Probably told a funny story. Say, you know these camels? They hold their head like this and they walk. <coughs> he said, in their last life, they're British. <laughs> and because of their, proud, their, their pride, now they're walking like this. <laughs> they raped this country. They drained it of millions and millions of dollars. They stole deities. They smashed deities, stole the, stole the gems from the deities' eyes and forehead. What right did they have? Because Indians were too shanti, shanti, shanti. Where, where is Shivaji when you need him? Where is Arjuna? Where is Yudhishthir? So there's a place for violence. Definitely. And even in today's politics, there's a place for violence. We're, we're non-violent. Non-violent means we'll never start anything. We should take note of this. Never, never be the aggressor. But if someone attacks, you just say, okay, shanti, shanti, shanti. They ask Gandhi, what would you do if your daughter was being raped in front of you? No, nothing. Non-violence. This is not non-violence. We're never the aggressor. But Manu Samhita says, when someone attacks you with a sharpened instrument, when they want to burn your house, steal your wife, murder you, poison you, is it shanti, shanti, shanti time? It's time to be the aggressor then, to protect your interest. This is politics. But wherever your mind is at the time of death, that will take you to your next destination. Therefore, in our life, while we have life and consciousness, we should fill our mind with Krishna. Krishna's form, his beauty, his mercy, his activities, his devotees, his temples, his prasad, his name, his festivals, Janmashtami, Gaur Purnima, Ram Navami. Fill our consciousness with these things. And then at the time of death, you remember this, and Chaktva Dehum Punar Janma Naiti Mamiti So there's a science to life also. Ultimately, yes, it means pure devotee of the Lord. No. There's a nice story. There was my godbrother Sham Sundra Prabhu had a very affectionate relationship with Prabhupada. And his daughter Saraswati at the time was three years old. He walked up to someone pulling their clothes. Do you know who is Krishna? And then he goes, No. Krishna is the supreme personality of God in three year olds. Prabhupada said, Perfect preaching. <laughs> so we should preach according to our realization. And anyone can preach Krishna consciousness. Tell someone, chant Hare Krishna. You can tell any, anyone that, chant Hare Krishna. You don't have to be a big pundit to, to explain the basics of spiritual life. But preach according to your realization. Don't preach something higher. Don't preach things you don't understand. <laughs> I'll tell you a story. One friend, he is sannyasi. He's not this kind of sannyasi, but he's my friend. He was having a program, Ram Navami. He said, come. He said, okay, I'll go. So there was one young man. He was just traveling around India. So I'm like, not exactly hippie. He was a cultured guy. But no standing in spiritual life. We don't even know if he's vegetarian. But my friend is preaching, preaching to him. What's he saying? He's talking about Srimati Radharani's Madanakya Mahabhav, Mudanakya Mahabhav, Manjari Bhav. And the guy's looking at him like, what are you talking about, man? Don't preach over your realization. This is inconceivable ecstasy of Srimati Radharani. And you're going to preach to some young guy who just happens to be passing through? You don't understand it yourself and you want to explain it to a young guy? 
who knows nothing about the ABCs of spirituality, you're speaking XYZ and he doesn't even know ABC. So <coughs> preach according to your realization. So anyone can preach, Saraswati can preach. Who is the Supreme Personality of Godhead? Krishna. Another time I was sitting at Sunday feast. So there's a brand new couple. I thought, oh, let me talk to them. So I sat next to them. There's one Madhaji, we're sitting in a line, right? So I sat next to them. Then one Madhaji sits down right in front of them. She starts preaching to them. Brand new people, first time to the temple. She says, do you know who is Lord Chaitanya? <laughs> He's Radha and Krishna combined. Krishna is blue and Radharani is golden. And Radharani is, Krishna has girlfriends and Radharani is Krishna's girlfriend. And they become one. And these new people are looking at her like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Technically speaking, did she say anything wrong? Radha Bhava Sivalitam Naomi Krishna Sarupa. Radha Krishna, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Radha Krishna, Nahiyanya, nothing less than Radha Krishna combined. But is this how we speak to young people, to brand new people? No. Preach according, this is the art of preaching Krishna consciousness. What to say and what not to say. So we should, Prabhupada said, the ability to preach is not like picking a fruit off a tree. Now I'm a great preacher. And we have to pray for the blessing to represent the adhikar, the qualification to represent <coughs> our guru. Preach according to your realization, but anyone can preach. Okay. If someone is chanting some wrong, it's not part of Janma, Janma Sakha. If someone's? If someone is chanting only some wrong, system wrong, or uh, uh, one is not full time devotee, then. He's, he's taken up the path. Just like if you're, if you're in university and you're going to college, you haven't graduated yet, but you're in college. And in course of time, if you f fulfill the course requirements, you will graduate. And this is, gen this is perfection. When you graduate, you get your degree, I'm done. Thank God. So <coughs> someone who's taking up the process, chanting japa, taking initiation from bona fide pramartic guru, this is the process. But it's not that you can't say anything to anyone and tell you, or, or Mahabhagavat, self-realized, Siddha, Siddha Purush. Anyone can preach. But Janma Sartak, Sartak Kari is relative term. There's different degrees of Sartak Kari, becoming perfect. You're also perfect. Compared to every man out on the street, outside this temple, you're like a Siddha Purush, Mahabhagavat. We bow down to you. You're a chanter of the holy name. You want Krishna. Samahatma, Sudurlava. Sudurlava Mahatma. Compared to every other person on the street. But are you, are you Siddha Purush? You're a beginner, you're a young devotee. There's lots of room for making progress. So, Janma Sartakari is relative. There's relative degrees of perfection. But wherever you are, you take up the process and try and help other people according to your means. Is okay? Somebody else? Prabhuji over here. Let's pass the mic. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you for the lecture, Prabhuja. I have one question that uh, you were talking about the culture and the decline in our Vedic culture. <coughs> so, when we come from a non devotee family, our parents they do not encourage us for following what, uh, whatever the Prabhupada told us and, and uh, our Vedic philosophy that themselves is not aware about it. So, is it fruitful to explain that? Uh, philosophy or even to try to do this or what can we do in such situation? This is a 
question that probably touches the lives of many of you. Very excellent question. It really depends on the degree to which they're uninterested in what you've, your lifestyle. If they're complete atheist, this is the most difficult thing. They're not completely atheistic people. But they're getting there. <laughs> They are not, they don't have uh, such, such kind of realization that yes, my son is good, but I do good. Yeah. You see, the thing is, they say, oh, Iskand is brainwashing young men. They're pulling young men out of the colleges and they're putting Tilak and Kanti Mala. This is the culture of your country. What Gotra is your family? Yes, Prabhu. What Gotra does your family belong to? Bharadwaj. So Bharadwaj? Bharadwaj. Your ancestor was a great devotee, a Siddha Purush, Mahatma. Was he wearing tank top and jeans and <laughs> baseball cap, short shorts, and going out clubbing and dancing with girls? If you go out and do that, your parents have no problem. Right? Oh, he's out having fun. Sometimes they even tell, uh, tell kids that you have a girlfriend, but don't do this must be an yeah, exactly. <laughs> Bingo! <laughs> they, they don't care. You can go quickly to hell and we don't mind. But if you want to chant Krishna's name and become happy and self-realized and try and help other people, oh, this is a horrible thing. Oh, what has happened to my son? The, the Hare Krishna's got hold of him and brainwashed him. They washed his brain. Our brain needs a thorough washing. It's full of all kinds of garbage. Kam, Krod, Lob, Madha, Matsarja. So this is the problem. The, the, and this is why I say, it's the most painful thing for Videshi Vaishnava to see Indian people, we hold your country in such high esteem. In Mayapur, I go on Harinam with devotees in the evening. And there's Chinese devotees, African devotees, Lithuanian devotees, uh, Russian, Mayapur is full of Russian devotees, Ukrainian devotees, Indonesian devotees, Italian devotees, American devotees even. And we're all chanting together Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. The Russians and the Ukrainians are chanting together. In their country they'd be shooting at each other. But in Mayapur they're Hare Bol, Hare Bol. So this is the beauty of Krishna consciousness. And it's the most painful thing to see that for foreigners to see people rejecting your own country. I have a, a, so, uh, an acquaintance in uh, Bangalore, Bengaluru. If I said, Nagendra, you can have a green card for America. All you have to do is cut off your arm. Okay, let's do, let's do it. Because he thinks America is like heaven, it is swarga. It's not swarga, it's narak. And that culture has invaded the world of clubbing and dancing and drinking and smoking and forgetting, uh, living a life completely forgetful of our relationship with God. Just the ABCs of spiritual life. Dehi no sminyata, dehi kwamaram, jovanam chara, tata dehantar prapti. They don't even understand ABC of spiritual life. This is not me. This is a lump of skin and flesh and fat and bone and hair. And how will I ever be happy trying to satisfy my mind and senses? The ABCs of spiritual life, they rejected. And to see that happening in India is very painful. Very painful. The devotees are very kind. They supply air ticket for me. So the class of persons on the air, on the, flying on the plane, they're all these type of people. They look at me like, they just don't get it. Like, you're a Westerner. What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? Where's your suit? Where's your slacks? Where's your dress shirt? Where's your briefcase? Where's your necktie? They become like pigs. These people are just become, and eating all kinds of nonsense, you have to hold your nose. Eating all nonsense. And it's not even food comes in a little plastic container and they pour hot water on it and now it's food. It's not even food. 
It pollutes your body, pollutes your brain. So whether you're a pig on the ground or whether you're a flying pig, it's all the same. And this is what's overtaking your country. The thing, this is what people want. Fly on the plane, have nice clothes, position, nice Rolex watch, girlfriend, clubbing, smoking, drinking, partying, having a good time, and going to hell. But if you, if you come home with a tilak and a kanti mala, oh, what are, you, what are you doing? What are you doing? My son, what are they doing to my son? But if you come home drunk, oh, he had a good time. What is that? What happened? What has happened to your beautiful country? The land of Rama and Krishna, the land of Bharadwaj. Think over these things. Now, how to deal with parents? Be very gentle with them. They love you. They want the best for you because they're bewildered. They don't understand the value of spiritual life. Deal with them very gently. <laughs> I did not deal gently with my parents. We had a competition in the Portland Temple that whoever distributed the most books got Lord Chaitanya's Maha Plate Sunday Feast. You get the whole thing. So somehow or other one week I got that plate. So I took it home to my parents. Shaven head. First time they saw me, right? Shaven head, big tila, kanti mala, dhoti, krota. Hi dad, Hare Krishna. What? <laughs> Then I'm giving prasadam, I'm making everyone take, if you eat this food, this is spiritual food, has Krishna's, has Krishna's saliva. <laughs> this food will liberate you. If you eat this food, you get a human birth in your next life. I'm making everyone eat, I'm making the dog eat it. I was a complete fanatic. They thought I was, com this guy went completely mad. So better you deal with your parents gently. Don't go home with a big tila. You have a beautiful tilak. Don't wear a big tilak home. You just take your kanti mala down. And you, sh and you show affection to your parents because they love you. And you should love them also and care for them. But introduce them slowly to the principles. Of bring some other devotee, especially some grihasta devotee. They'll think, oh, he's got a wife, he's normal. What is this celibacy thing? Oh, is it insane? And, and thoughtfully introduce Krishna consciousness to them. Show them pictures of Narendra Modi glorifying ISKCON. All these MPs glorifying ISKCON. Big important people becoming ISKCON devotees. Vivek Bindra. You can give them a good motivational talk. So deal with your parents carefully because they love you. And respectfully. Don't be in their face. This is what I'm doing. I don't care what you say. Deal with them respectfully, because this is our culture. This is our culture to respect parents, especially mother. Mother is our first guru. Is that helpful? Yes, but we still have time. Okay, you try. You pray to Lord Nityananda. He's Adi Guru. So he, you're actually you're like your parents' guru. It's supposed to be the other way around. But many parents actually have become devotees because their son or daughter became a devotee. True. Your parents also? Uh, in the later part of their life. Yeah, many devotees. Premanjana Prabhu, Murali Krishna Prabhu. Karanachandi. Hmm? Karanachandi, yes. His father is chanting Japa now. <laughs> we went there, I hammered him a little bit. You have everything, why are you not chanting? Give one round, chant one round. Okay, I will do. So now he's chanting four rounds. Very pious man. What is view? Karuna Chandra, sadhu, number one sadhu. Yeah. Great devotee. So be gentle with your parents. Any other question? He's passing. Okay, next. If we have a disturbing question, should it, uh, it is right to ask in, uh, in front of everyone which questions faith 
If you're, if you're feeling shy to ask in front of everyone, you can ask me personally, one on one. I'm not feeling shy, but I think that this question will disturb others' faith also. Okay, speak anything. I'm prepared to answer any question. Like, uh, you said that how painful it was that the Britishers stole our baby's eyes, stole their jail. So, uh, the disturbing word came that, uh, but uh, how the DT is going to save us if he cannot save himself? Like, uh, Britishers uh, said that they worship their whole life the science, and the science gave them power to do what they, uh, what they have done. But uh, we uh, worshipped all, all our lifetime uh, deities. But mm. uh, they uh, were what they gave us, like in terms of. Uh, and I'm not uh, questioning. Oh, no, it's a reasonable. Uh, nothing wrong. No problem. But, uh, There's an understanding for that also. Like, uh, and uh, many uh, devotees die saving the deities from uh, the attackers. But. Uh, uh, but I think so some in a subtle way God is help uh, uh, his devotees. But how he God help the devot uh, his worshippers uh, when he uh, when they are dying in front of him and he just uh, standing smiling. Hmm. If you think he's standing, there, the deity also walks. What to speak of British? The British, the Muslims smash deities. It's their favorite thing. They smash deities and make steps into the masjid. So all the pious Muslims can step on the broken deities as they go in to do namaz. So everyone knows deity is what? Is metal, wood, stone. It can be painting also, jewels, manasik. Deity is deity. But is the deity wood? Is the deity wood? If you think the deity is wood, you do not understand what deity is. If you think deity can be smashed, you don't understand what deity is. Krishna comes archa avatar. He descends in a form that we can approach. You can't, can you, for example, if you think, let me offer rasgulla to Krishna. Without deity, how do you throw it in the air? Here, catch. <laughs> he comes to accept our offering in a form that we can approach. Because our body is material, he comes in a material form. <coughs> that we can approach. We can approach wood and stone and metal and glass and all these things. But he's present. Deities, you may smash the deity. Have you smashed God? Deity is a representation of God. Archa avatar. It's a representation. It's not that I smash it now. We killed your Krishna. There's no more Krishna. We smash Krishna's deity. No more Krishna. Is that it? And is Krishna actually standing by? We've created our life. Our life has a beginning and a life has an end. If someone gives her life to, to protect the deity out of love of God, they will go back to God yet. There is no doubt. So deity can also walk. Many stories of this. It's actually... We went on Parakrama to one beautiful place uh, called Agra Dweep. It's a place of Govinda Ghosh, Madhav Ghosh, Vasudev Ghosh, Govinda Ghosh, three Ghosh brothers, amazing singers. People would hear that singing and their heart would melt, tears would come from their eyes. Just hearing their beautiful singing. So Govinda Ghosh's deity was Gopinath. So Gopinath, and under the inspiration of Gopinath and other devotees, Govinda Ghosh was inspired that you take a wife and have family. So he married and he had a son. But in due course of time, the wife and son both expired prematurely. So Govinda Ghosh was very depressed. He wanted me to be married and have family. And now you took them. You took my family. Who will do my shraddha? Gopinath said, I will do your shraddha. I will do. And every year to this day, 500 years later, Govinda our Gopinath, they put on a white dress, they put kusha straw in his hand, and they carry one stick in Bengali tradition. When one is mourning, they carry one stick. And for two weeks, Govind, Gopinath only eats kichri. And everybody comes to the temple for eating kichri, Mahaprasad. Every year like this, Sakshi Gopal walked all the way across India 
Pratima Nahitumi Sakshat Brajendra Nandana. But you're not a statue. You're the Supreme Lord in a form that I can see. And he walked all the way across. He had this argument. I won't tell, it's a long story, but the Pujari, the, the, the young Brahmin was having an argument with the Lord. He said, you, you said you become witness, but now you have to come. The deity spoke to him and says, I can't come, I'm a deity. But the widows are very intelligent. He said, okay, if you can talk, you can walk. Chalo. So Krishna walked all the way across Arisa. And he said, you'll know I'm there because you'll hear my, what are they called? Nupur, Gang Gungura. Chung, 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 chung. He said, don't look back. Then he didn't hear. Oh, then go. Did he leave? Did he leave me? He looked back and Govinda is standing. So at that place, this is Sakshi Gopal. You can see beautiful deity of Krishna. Toto Gopinath. When Advaita Charya, uh, not Advaita Charya, Gadadhar Pandit, after the disappearance of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he was so devastated that even though he was young, his body became old and he couldn't lift his arms to put mala around the neck of Gopinath. So Gopinath sat down. Only sitting deity in the world, I think. You see, he's sitting, Toto Gopinath. Gopinath's garden, this temple, beautiful garden in Puri. So Krishna is sitting like this. Deity can walk, he can talk, he can sit down. If you have the eyes to see. Ashradadana purusha dharma sasya parantapa aprapya maam nivartante mrityu sansara vartmani. Krishna says in Gita, someone who is faithless cannot achieve me. We make progress according to our faith. The deity reciprocates with us according to our faith. If you want to see him as a, as a statue, he'll remain a statue forever. Another story. How many? I can tell you many stories about deity worship. Srila Prabhupada, in, in, in contemporary story. Srila Prabhupada walked in Los Angeles Temple. This temple is very long. It's an old temple building. And he stopped. He would come in, take Chanamrita, offer pranam, sit in Vyasas and give class. He walked to the temple and he stopped. Deity is maybe 60 meters away. And he stopped and said, there is something in Krishna's eye. The small Utsav deity. The Bajari went and he looked very carefully and said, Prabhupada, there's nothing in this. There is something in Krishna's eye. Look again. He looked again very carefully. There's a tiny fleck of tilak in Krishna's eye. Can Prabhupada see that from the back of the room? Krishna is speaking to him. Another time, His Holiness Sachinandan Swami, when he was Brahmachari, he was Bhakta in our Hamburg temple. His service was to wash the deity plates. But he was a new devotee and he was going through a very hard time. His father was leaving this world and there was a tradition in their family that whenever request a dying person made, you are obliged to fulfill. His father didn't like the devotees. So he thought, if I go to see my father, he's going to say, leave Hare Krishna. So how can I see him? But how can I not see him? So this conflict was raging within him. And worse, his girlfriend's calling him up, you know, I miss you. So this conflict is raging in his life and his service is to wash the deity place. So he's washing and he's just like, his mind's somewhere else like this. And what is the system? After the Balya Bog, the plates come off the altar, the curtain is open. Govindam Madhipurusham Tamaham Bhajani. There's no plate on the altar. So Prabhupada's standing on the altar, greeting the deities, and he stops. He said, Who is washing Krishna's plates? They're doing a very rotten job. You go see, correct them. He's not doing his job properly. The plate should be spotlessly clean and they're still dirty. He's not washing them properly. How did Prabhupada know? There's no plate on the altar. Krishna's telling him, your sishya, take care of this. He's doing a bad job. Your sishya, living tilak in my eye. Another time Prabhupada came, my godbrother, Amayatma Prabhu, he thought, the car is going to come up to the curbside. Prabhupada's door will open. 
he'll step out and I'll be right there. So he made this plan. I'll open Prabhupada's door, I'll be right next to Prabhupada. But the devotee said, no, 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 you, there's service to do, you please do your service, we have to get ready for Prabhupada. Okay, what to do? So Prabhupada came, a hundred devotees streamed through the front door of Los Angeles temple. And the crowd pushed him right next to Prabhupada. Prabhupada was praying with his hands folded in front of Rukmini Dwarkadish. And he was right, standing right in back of Prabhupada and he could hear Prabhupada speaking to Rukmini Dwarkadish. And he's asking them, I see you're wearing a very beautiful outfit today. They give you an outfit like this all of the time. Then silence. Krishna speaking back. Amyadna Prabhu is not hearing what Krishna is saying, but he's hearing Prabhupada's side of the conversation. Are they offering you a nice bhoga? Did they give you a nice outfit like this? Are devotees coming from Mangalarti? Are you happy here? This conversation is going back and forth. This is reality, Prabhu. If you have eyes to see. If you have eyes to see. And it's based on Shraddha. Ashraddhana Purusha Dharma Sasya Parantapa. Without Shraddha, you'll never remember. You'll be a deity for you'll be a statue forever. I like to worship deities. I always had Pujari. So I have different realization than you. I worship twenty Shalagam Shilas at home. Someone can say it's just a stone. It's a stone. But is it only a stone? Tulsi Maharani? Is Tulsi Maharani only a plant? There's leaves and roots and flowers and chlorophyll and cellulose and seeds and bark. We can say it's a plant. Some people just rip them up. They're in the way. And some weed, some Tulsi weed. Get it out of here. Is Tulsi just a plant? Radha Krishna Seva Pavoe Abhilasi. We pray. You please give me service. Srila Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur. He prayed. Samastavai kunta shiromana shi krishna sya brindavana danyadami Data dikara vishavana putta bhinde namaste charanara nindam He said, I'm offering my obeisances to Brinda Devi who was given charge of Goloka Vrindavan, all the activities of Radha Krishna Seva how the wind will blow, what scent it will carry, how what scent will offer to Radharani what flowers she'll wear in her hair, what outfit she'll wear, how we'll decorate Kunja. All this confidential service is under the jurisdiction of Brinda Devi, who appears to us in the form of Tulsi Maharani. Is it an empty prayer? Eneve Danadara Sakhiranu Gatakara Seva Adhikara Diye Koro Nijadasa. Give me the Adhikar, the qualification to worship Radha Krishna and Vrindavan. Make me a follower of the Sakis. Make me your dasi. Is it an empty prayer? Are we so foolish? Are our acharyas so foolish not to understand these things? Is Tulsi a plant? Is a deity a statue? Reassess your understanding. You have another question? Is okay? I hope it's helpful to you. Thank you for your thoughtful question. There's an answer to that. Two things I can say. Everyone understands the question? Two things I can say. First of all, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur makes nice commentary in this verse. Yastranda Gopamata Vendrama Samusa Karma 
Mandana Rupa Falabaja Namatanoti, Karmani near Dahati Kintu Jabakti Bajam, Govinda Mari Purusham Tamahamadi. There he explains in the purport that how karma works, that the Lord within the heart as super soul inspires a person to act in such a way to fulfill his karma. Let me give you an example. As I was saying, I used to do prison preaching. And there was a guy in one prison, he's a bank robber. Twice he got arrested for robbing a bank. He's going to die in prison because he's thinking there's that, that building, that bank is full of money and I'm going to go get some. So what did he do? He wrote on a piece of paper, I have a gun, give me all the money. He didn't have a gun. But he wrote on a piece of paper, he walked in, gave it to the teller, the teller gave him the money, so they have an arrangement. He walks out one door, the door behind him, dunk, closes. The door in front of him, dunk, closes. He's caught. But he's thinking, I'm going to go get money to get this. And that thought is inspired by what? By super soul. Go do this. Why? Because his destiny is to die in prison. To fulfill his destiny, inspiration comes from his heart to fulfill his destiny. So destiny is a tricky thing. We can understand it in this way. Let's say you're on the train, Rajdani Express, Delhi to Calcutta. You're on the train, you're in your seat, you're, I found the right seat, I've got my ticket, you're loaded, the train's moving, you're going to Calcutta. That's destiny. While you're on the train, what will you do? You can take a nap, you can read a book, you can talk to a friend, you can eat something, you can look out the window, there's a hundred things you can do in the scope of destiny. So destiny and free will exist side by side. It's not absolute destiny. If we say everything is absolutely determined, what is the question of bhakti? I will become Krishna conscious when Krishna wants me to become Krishna conscious. We have to plead, we have to beg Krishna. They asked when Siddha Purush, Bhamsi Das Bhavaji Maharaj, when the body asked him, how do I become Krishna conscious? He answered in one word, he said, cry. So destiny can change also. So but destiny and free will exist side by side. We have our destiny. If there's no destiny, then you can get anything you want. Be a Kaurapati. Just by desiring to become Kaurapati, can you become Kaurapati? If you decide, I want to become the Prime Minister of India, can, just by desiring it, can it happen? There's no destiny involved? If it's not your destiny, you can never achieve it. But free will must also be there because without free will, we're just robots. Moving by, the will, by, the, by destiny. Both things are truth. Destiny and free will exist side by side. And our karma plays out by inspiration from the Lord in your heart. You do this thing. You wanted this. That's your last life, you wanted this. You wanted to make money, so here's the way to do it. With, and a person who is devoid of any relationship with God says, Yes, I have done it. But what does Gita say? Prakrite kriyamanani gunai karmani sarvashaha ahankara vimudadma karta ham iti manyate. Vimud, someone who thinks like this, vimudha. Particularly foolish. Vishesha mudha. Particularly if he thinks, I am doing everything. This is the atheistic mentality. When atheists wrote a poem called Invictus, that it matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the soul. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. I am the boss. This is atheistic mentality. Ishuroham aham bogi, sedoham balavan suki. I'm perfect, powerful and happy and I can make it happen. No, you can't. If it's not your destiny. We have free will. And we have destiny, side by side. Okay. Bhagavatam says, Tasyaya Vaheto Prayate to Kovido Nalabyate Yad Brahmutamu Paryata Talabyati Dukka Vananyata Sukam Kalina Sarvata Gabira Rangasa. Bhagavatam is very clear on this point. It says, endeavor for that thing which isn't available. 
searching from Satya Lok, Brahma Lok, all the way down to Patolok. What is that thing? That is Krishna Bhakti. And as far as materialistic happiness is concerned, that comes automatically, just as in due course of time we get distress. Comes automatically. Nobody goes to the masjid, the mandir, the, mand the synagogue, the church, and prays to God, please give me trouble. Oh dear Lord, please let my house burn down, wreck my car. Please, I want some incurable, deadly disease. No one prays for these things, but doesn't distress and calamity come in every single person's life to some degree, at some time or other, everyone's life. Bhagavatam is saying, your prosperity and happiness comes in the same way. Srila Prabhupada said, you cannot get more in life than you're destined, and you can't get less. If we understand that, not more and not less, life becomes so stress-free. You work as you're obliged to work, as you feel inspired to work, and leave the result to Krishna. Karmanyabhahikaraste ma paleshu kanat. Fruit, paleshu, is up to him. You're obliged to work as you're, you're not entitled to the fruits of action, but you're obliged to work as you're... This is ABC Bhagavad Gita. So Bhagavad Gita is so relevant to every class of person. You want to be a businessman? Bhagavad Gita will give you first class advice. You want to be a sadhu? Bhagavad Gita will give you first class advice. Everything is there in Bhagavad Gita. So relevant for all classes, for all time and eternity. Because Sri Bhagavan Uvacha. He wants us to be happy. It's a manual. Bhagavad Gita is a manual. How to negotiate material life. Like when you buy a new car. What's in the little, we call it glove box in America. You open it up. There's an instruction manual. You put the petrol here. Don't put the petrol in the, in the windshield fluid. Don't put the oil in the petrol place. How to make the car run properly to get best use from the car. This is instruction manual. Gita is instruction manual for human society. Applicable to all classes of human beings. So we distribute Bhagavad Gita. This institution, this, even this, this temple, NCR, NCR Delhi, in one year, 2018, 16, one year they distributed 8 lakhs Bhagavad Gita in one month. Other Gaudi institutions haven't distributed that many Bhagavad Gita in the duration of their existence. And ISKCON did it in one month. Why? Because we want people to be knowledgeable, to be happy, to know how to live their life and achieve the highest destination. This is, the, this is Paramar doing good to human society. Janma Sartakari Para Paropakar. It's Paropakar. People think, you, you guys are out on the street ha hammering us this Bhagavad Gita. You're always selling things. This, that. You're always asking for money. What are we doing when you see these brahmacharis? They're great souls. They're coming from high class families. Some of them very wealthy families. They're educated, born in pious families. And they left all of that to sleep on the floor and work to uplift human society. Such, such worshipable individuals left everything for the welfare of human society. And what are we doing? People are taking money, yes. Give. <laughs> Prabhupada told a story. When man is going out for bhiksha, going out for bhiksha, knocking on doors, and they come to the door, who is there? Oh, bhiksha dehi, bhiksha dehi, you please give me some money. So the man gives some money. Stupid form. Okay. So he gives some money. And he comes back the next day, Bhikshu Dehi, Bhikshu Dehi. I gave you money yesterday. What did you do? I already spent for Krishna. I already spent for... We're collecting money, yes, but what are we doing? Just in NCR Delhi. How many temples? 16, 18 temples? Ro Rohini's opening. Dwarka's opening. Janmanagar. Kurukshetra. Big, huge, beautiful temples. Are they free? Does, does the cement and the steel and the glass and the, and the copper ever... It falls from the sky and you just put it together. It's expensive. So we collect money for the welfare of society. Because this is like the sun and the rain. The sun does what? The sun evaporates the water from the earth. It forms a cloud. And the cloud gives back the water to the earth. 
So we're taking money from society for the welfare of society and giving it back to them in the form of knowledge, Bhagavad Gita, prasadam distribution, beautiful marble mandirs, deity worship, educational programs, bhakti vriksha, sankirtan, prasadam distribution. Is that all free? It costs money. So fortunate people who understand that principle donate liberally for this principle, for the welfare of society. Measure your wealth, not by your bank account. Measure your wealth by how much you've spent, how much you've given in Krishna service. That is your wealth. At the time of death, that is your wealth. Your bank account can help you when the last breath comes. Your degree cannot help you when the last breath comes. Your family cannot help you. Your bank balance, your car, your home. Only thing that can help you is your relationship with God. Your punya, your sukriti. What have you spent? What have you given for God? Anything else? We're over time. I'm servant to these Brahmins. I just do what they tell me to do. <laughs> Your next class will huh? Your next class will okay. I'm just Vaikuntha Vrajas, hum humble servant. So. so thank you very much for your kind attention. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Yeah.